Good evening. I'm Carol Saltz. I'm director at Teachers College Press. Thanks so much on behalf of Teachers College Press for joining us. Um, tonight we're here to celebrate, to eat, to drink, to share ideas provoked by two wonderful books. Um, first, a few quick thank yous. <laughs> Thanks to our authors, Bill Ayers and Joel Westheimer, for joining us to talk about teaching with conscience in an imperfect world. That's Bill's book. And What Kind of Citizen, Joel's book. Um, these are their most recent works, but also really their life work. Um, these books embody their ideas and beliefs, raising urgent issues that both Joel and Bill have raised individually and collectively in their teaching, writing, and thinking. A thank you to all of you. Um, we need Bill and Joel and Dr. Ruth to keep us honest and focused. But all of us in education, teachers, students, parents, researchers, administrators, publishers, have a role to play. Uh, I ask you to do a little work in the midst of the celebrating. Maybe ask a question of Bill and Joel that connects their work to your work, and that will help us to begin a conversation. And now I have the happy task of introducing and thanking Dr. Ruth Westheimer. So now you are aware of her many accomplishments as teacher, author, critic, social commentator, television and radio personality, and mom um, of two children and grandmom of four grandchildren. She is an amazing woman, fearless, funny, caring, thoughtful, and wise beyond her years. Thank you, Ruth, for getting us started, for great, graciously providing an introduction for Bill and Joel to the evening's proceedings. Ruth has designated me MC as well as Dr. Ruth introducer. And while I'm not really good at winging it, I'm figuring that with Bill and Joel piloting this, and with the strange state of US politics, with the constantly contentious role that education plays in the performance of US politics, and with Dr. Ruth Westheimer as our secret weapon, it's probably safe for me to turn these proceedings over to them and to you. Uh, I know they want to keep their remarks short and to allow us to celebrate maybe sign some books, and to allow for questions and conversation about what can bring about change for the better, change for good, ideas that can rock the current discourse and move the practice of education to a better place in a better world. Dr. Ruth? Uh, it really is uh, what an honor and pleasure it is for me to introduce two extraordinary educators and their works, their books by Teachers College Press. William Ayers, author of Teaching with Conscience in an Imperfect World, and Joel Westheimer, author of What Kind of Citizen? Educating Our Children for the Common Good by Joel Westheimer, should both be congratulated. First of all, for being in the noble profession of education, but more importantly, for furthering their field with these two important works. There is a Talmudic saying in the Jewish tradition that says, a teacher learns from his students, and this is well documented in both books. I'm about to turn 88, and one important reason that I continue to teach is that after each class, I know that I have learned as much from my students as they have learned from me. I particularly enjoyed reading Joel's account of one of his students, Akim, and what he learned from him. Both authors beautifully describe the relationships that developed with their students, which will evoke among all of us here, who are teachers, the wonderful memories we have from our own experiences in teaching. I still meet people who had Joel as a teacher, and they remember him well and with a smile. As I mentioned, both authors believe in the importance of teachers and students developing close relationships to improve the educational experience. And I'm grateful to Bill and Joel for providing us with books that will help us learn new ways of thinking about education and most especially about creating a community of learners. After all, we don't send our children to school only so that they develop a certain set of skills. Our schools should be teaching our children how to be good citizens, 
how to improve society and respect it. I know there is a lot of talk these days about what belongs in a school curriculum, but our schools need to do more than just pour knowledge into our children. They need to shape their students to be the best that they can be in terms of their values as well as their knowledge. And when schools operate with these broader aims in mind, the students really respond. So, Carol and honored guests, it's time to hear from our authors, Bill and Joel. And afterward, I'm sure you'll feel as I do, that teachers all over the world, and particularly those who graduated from this wonderful institution, need to have their names shouted from the rooftops for the work that they do. Congratulations. In the conversation about teaching and learning and schooling and what direction we're going. Um, and we'll get into that uh, as we go along. I thought to start that I would ask Joel to begin and say a bit about the frame of your book. And, and that way it'll kind of give us a sense of, of where we might where we might take the conversation. So we'll start by saying a few words, and, and I think Joel should start by giving us a, a bit of a synopsis of what you've done and why you've done it. And we're gonna quickly open it up to everybody. All but right. Joel, why don't you begin? Thanks, Bill. And, and you know, Bill and I have done a few events like this, and what's nice, not in these, about these books in particular, but what's really nice is that uh, our writing interleaves and goes over this, the, some of the same things in, from different angles. You know why that is? Why is that? Because I plagiarize for yeah. whatever you <laughs> but, I, I, but I don't call it plagiarism anymore. I call it sampling. Yeah. Or, <laughs> Or collaging. I just take what you write and I just make it, put in my own words. <laughs> and, um, you know, Carol mentioned this particular time in our, our political moment here. And uh, I think we can probably all agree that there's kind of this grave threat um, to democracy going on in this country, not only because of uh, corporate and financial interest in politics, but, of, but also because of growing economic inequality. And one of the things that drove me to write this book um, was uh, the idea that schools, we now, you know, probably it's familiar to you too, we talk about schools as arms of the economy or as job training institutions, right? And we've lost the language of talking about schools in the way that actually public education was founded in this country, which is to educate a democratic citizenry. Um, citizens ready to participate in the democratic process. Um, it's the, you know, the famous Thomas Jefferson quote, if the uh, people are not well educated enough to govern their own affairs, then the solution is not to take that power of governance away from them, but to educate them. And uh, the driving force for me in this book is that in a democratic society, schools have a role to play that must be different from schools in, say, a totalitarian dictatorship. And I think one of the key differences is that we need to teach kids um, to ask questions and to traffic in multiple perspectives and multiple ideas. And uh, that's where I think uh, uh, the values that my mother was talking about um, come in, because of course there's no such thing as a values-free education, and Bill's writing uh, so beautifully articulates that in everything that he's written. Um, but in this particular book, which I'm gonna ask Bill to talk about in a minute, of course he zeroes in on this notion of conscience and uh, why schools have to take this conscience. When I talk about citizenship, um, that can be such a boring word, right? I mean, people think of, God forbid, I should say civic education, and you just like keel over and fall asleep. Um, it'd be like that Ferris Bueller days off scene, you know, anyone, anyone, <laughs> and the, the kids drooling on the front desk. Um, but, but citizenship to me, and I hope now to you after tonight, is an exciting word because what it really is, is the biggest question that we have for our schools, which is what kind of people do we want leaving the schoolhouse doors when they graduate, right? What kind of society do we want them to build? And so having said that, let me ask you a question, Bill, because um, I talk about citizenship and I even go into citizenship education and the different kinds that are out there. Uh, and in, you, you've risen, written more than a dozen books on these kind of topics, um, but you have this new book, and, and it has the word conscience in it, teaching with conscience, and I want to know what drove you to write this particular book at this particular moment in time. 
Um, I'll say that, but I'm looking at our picture over there, and I'm, I'm disconcerted. Doesn't this feel like a Stalinist pep rally or something? <laughs> the, the, um, the authors are up there. That, that's really weird, um, um, especially when we're talking about citizenship and conscience. God, take that down. Yeah, but I have um, headphones on. I'm talking to the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see. Um, you know, the, the thing about, uh, you know, I, I have written a lot about teaching and learning and schooling and school reform. What what was troubling to me and what led to this particular intervention, and it really is a pamphlet more than anything. It's, it's a short intervention into the discussion. But the corporate school reformers seem like they've got the upper hand, that they have everything going for them. And by the corporate reformers, I mean those who are advocating for pretty much a three-pronged um, uh, idea of transforming education. One prong is reducing education to a single metric that can be measured simply on a single standardized test. The reduction of education to that. Um, a second prong of it is obliterating any collective voice of the teachers. The unions is the target, but it's more than that. It's that teachers should have no collective voice. Um, and, and the third is the privatizing of a public space. And that's the agenda that's been driving the school discussion for three decades. And what's amazing is that while the corporate reformers have had, um, have had uh, you know, the, all the money, all the foundations, um, all the, the representatives from the political parties, the, the uh, conceding of the chattering class and the media. <coughs> so it seems to many of us in the schools that they have everything. But the astonishing thing after three decades of corporate thrust into school reform is that not only have they not won, they don't have teachers, they don't have parents, and they don't have students. Mm -hmm. And one of the astonishing <coughs> things is looking at Janie Hirschman, who's one, been one of the leaders for many, many years uh, in New York, of pushing back against that agenda, of pushing back against the testing regime and so on, and mobilizing parents to opt out, for example. Who could have imagined? But that's what always have. That's what, actually, what gives me the most hope is that you know you can only sit on people so long. You can only put a pillow over somebody's face for so long before they push back. And the pushback is worth noting and worth being excited about. So what I wanted to do was to say, look, the way that the that the reform discussion is framed is that there are two camps. There's the corporate school reformers. This was actually articulated brilliantly in a New Yorker piece, which was a puff piece about Arne Duncan. I don't know if you remember a beautiful mm -hmm. silver soft picture of Arne and this kind of, and they said there are two camps in the school reform discussion. One is the revolutionaries who want to privatize the schools and charterize everything and get the test scores and accountability. And the other is the status quo crowd. So we all are the status quo crowd. We just think the schools are great, you know, and we'll defend <laughs> It will defend them as they are. And that, that's the big lie. That's a complete lie. That's a framing that's completely dishonest. And so I wanted to say, not only is that a lie, but what are we fighting for? We're not just fighting for the status quo. We're not fighting against the corporate reformers because we, you know, because we think that they're bad people with horns and so on. We're fighting for something. And what is that something? And Ruth articulated it beautifully. It's a... It's a the idea that every kid in a democracy deserves a neighborhood school that's fully functioning, that, that embraces the kids as who they are, that challenges them to go deeper and further, that listens to them, that cares about them, that sees them as fully human. And one of the arguments I get into all the time in Chicago, and I'm in it very ferociously these days, is that my argument, along with John Dewey, who said it right in the chapel over here, um, is that in a democracy, whatever the most privileged and wisest parents want for their children, we as a community must demand for all of our children. That it, anything less than that destroys democracy. And so when, 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 these, when the corporate reformers talk about choice, they're not saying, let's take the University of Chicago Laboratory School, set it down next to DuSable High School, and let the parents choose. That's not what they're saying. <laughs> they're doubling down on the very things that failed these kids before in a shinier shell or a shinier building, but it's the same 
approach to teaching and learning that has failed these kids persistently, and they're saying, let's do more of this. It's not choice. It's not a real choice. So I look at, I look at the University of Chicago laboratory schools where Barack Obama sent his kids, um, where Arne Duncan went to school and sends his kids currently, where Mayor Daley and Mayor Emanuel send their kids, where Mona sent her kids and I sent my kids. And here's a school of tremendous privilege. And what they have and what they advocate is not what the kids two miles down the road have. And the people like Arne Duncan, who have been in charge of the schools for 14 years, to come back to Chicago and not be able to find a single school in all the thousands of schools that he's built and influenced, not a single school good enough for his kids, that speaks volumes to what's wrong with the corporate school reform agenda. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. One of the things that you raised, Bill, is, um, and, and my mother raised it too, is this, this power of the relationship between teacher and student as a, a, a powerful countervailing force, really, to the corporate um, reform. I had a student uh, teacher who went into a, a job interview, and there, there were uh, the vice principal and the principal was very formal on one side of the table, and he was on the other side, and they, they leaned forward, and they, and they said, um, so Jerry, uh, why do you want to become a teacher? And he leaned back, and he said, power, prestige, and money. There you right? go. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, and it, 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 and of course, they you know there was this awkward silence in the room, and then, and the, and then they all laughed when he realized he was joking. He did get the job eventually, by the way. But, and it's interesting because we can joke about obviously you know teachers don't go in it for the prestige, uh, and and they I hope they don't go in it for the money, um, because it's not very good. Uh, but but the power is something interesting, right? And this is something we both talk about um, because uh, no teachers don't have the kind of power that the CEO of a Fortune 500 company has, um, but they have a different kind of power, which is the the power to affect thousands upon thousands of kids' lives in, in deep and meaningful ways. Uh, and I think both of us, uh, in different ways, want to harness that power uh, and use it as a way to um, push back. And in some ways, this is a very uh, opt I haven't felt this in the, in, in the last 10 years, but this is a very optimistic time, weirdly enough, in, in addition to being a troublesome time, um, because of the massive, um, massive galvanizing of the opt-out movements that are pushing back um, against a kind of education that is uh, demoralized and, uh, and sapped from everything meaningful that goes on in classrooms. And I sometimes, since I'm living in Canada, I, uh, I, I sometimes say I'm like, I feel like a um, character from one of those dystopic sci-fi novels, you right. know, because I go to the U.S. and it's like, it, you know, the, the things that happen in the U.S. seep across the border into Canada. So it's like going back to the future. And so <laughs> I come back and I say, I've seen the future. It's horrible. Don't go there. My God. Um, but now I can kind of I can kind of flip that because the opt-out movements have not hit Canada yet with the same rigor that they have hit um, here, and uh, and they will come because they are gathering steam here. And as Bill says, the kind of schools that Arne Duncan and all the the entire members of the the Senate and the Congress and so forth send their kids to do not have standardized tests. They are exempt. Um, from them. Yeah. They have class sizes of 12 students. Um, they have all the things that the school reformers are not fighting for in our schools. And the end They have the arts. They have the arts, yeah. exactly. And so uh, I think that there's, I do think there's a lot of hope there, do you? I do, but I, I, you know, Joel gave himself a sabbatical in a writing retreat at my house. <laughs> he came down from Canada and- I wouldn't I, have finished the book without and that. He, <laughs> and he wrote this, this book partly sitting at my living room table and it was wonderful. And um, at one point, I got uh, in the mail my Medicare choices, you know, for retired people. And, <laughs> and it was a book this thick. And as I was trying to work my way through it and understand what the hell it was talking about, Joel, very meanly, I think, pulled out a single <laughs> credit card and said, here's my health plan from Canada. And I'm like, dude. The, the health like, card, not yeah, a credit that, card. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a health card. It looked like a credit card. It was everything, glasses and drugs and everything. And I have this book like this. I'm trying to, damn. Yeah, I was thinking of the dystopia. Yeah. I think, I think you know, the, the, partly you know that I'm a hopeful person. I'm not an optimistic person. Yeah. But I, I don't think that it makes any sense to... Um, you know, I've always felt that optimists and pessimists share a deterministic view of life. They all think they know what's going to happen. 
And in reality, none of us knows what's going to happen. If you go back five years or 10 years, who could have imagined gay marriage? Who could have imagined 20 years ago? Or who could have imagined um, a controversy over bathrooms and transgendered people? <laughs> We've been talking about that all day. What a weird, invented bullshit, you know, kind of. Anyway, um, so, so you don't know what's going to happen. But what we do know is that what we do or don't do can, in fact, make a difference. And the opt-out moment is part of that. But, but there are many other examples. You talk about power. I think we could expand that notion and say many of us who think of ourselves as somewhat politically aware or trying to be, trying to keep up, we spend too much time looking at the sites of power we have no access to. The White House, the medieval auction block called the Congress. Um, the, and, and not enough time spent looking at the sites of power we have absolute access to the neighborhood, the community, the classroom, the church, the synagogue, the mosque, whatever. These are places we have access. Why do we not mobilize that power, which can be much more forceful and much more important? And it's in our, it's in our fingertips. And I think that's something that we, we need to kind of change our, our approach to. But I think this is a very exciting time to be alive because it's a time when so much is in the balance and so much counts on what we do. And I think that um, I think that one of the things that's terrific about being a teacher is that sense of hopefulness, that sense that I'm going to change the world, maybe one kid at a time, maybe one classroom at a time. But that's kind of what it's motivated by, mm -hmm. that sense. Yeah. So I want you guys to now jump in. Schools are mirror and window to societies. They always are that there's nowhere in the world that you couldn't go and look at the society and figure out what the schools must be like, or, or, or go into the schools and figure out what the society must be like. So apartheid South Africa had beautiful, state-of-the-art, small classroom schools for the European descendant kids, and they had giant, broken down, you know, 50 kids in a classroom uh, out in the rural areas for the African kids. That was perfectly understandable if you knew what apartheid was. Some kids were going toward running the society, some were going toward the prisons and the mines and the unemployment lines, right? Um, it's true historically that, that um, you go to some place like fascist Germany or fascist Italy, those schools produced some brilliant scientists and athletes and musicians. They also produced obedience and conformity as any authoritarian society would so that you know, people allowed themselves to allow the marching of people into the ovens. This is, obedience and conformity is the name of the game in an authoritarian school system. And so we don't like to think about the schools as reflecting who we are, especially when they're broken and not working well. But in fact, the schools tell us exactly who we are. And, and in a democracy, you would think that the underlying goals of a school would be um, the recognition that every human being is of incalculable value, and therefore the schools would be based on uh, foregrounding initiative, courage, creativity, imagination, and so on. And that an authoritarian school would foreground obedience and conformity. So let me read just one paragraph from this. The obsessions that characterize American classrooms today, especially urban classrooms and schools attended by the poor, recent immigrants from impoverished countries, First Nations peoples and the descendants of formerly enslaved people are simple. The goal is obedience, standardization, and conformity. The watchword is control. These schools are characterized by passivity and fatalism and infused with anti-intellectualism, dishonesty, and irrelevance. They turn on the familiar technologies of constraint, ID cards, uniform dress codes and regulations, surveillance cameras, armed guards, metal detectors, random searches, and the elaborate schemes for managing the fearsome, potentially unruly mob, the knotted system of rules, the exhaustive machinery of schedules and clocks and surveillance, the unesthetic physical space and prison architecture, the laborious programs of regulating, indoctrinating, inspecting, disciplining, censuring, correcting, counting, appraising. It goes on, I'll stop there. Um, <laughs> all of this makes it feel like an institution of punishment, not enlightenment a place to recover from rather than an experience to carry forward. And I think that's those schools, that, that's the way we see some of our schools, but not all of our schools. That's why I made the contrast between 
the wealthy schools in Chicago and schools that look like this because the Arne Duncans of the world would never allow their kids to go to a school like yeah. this and yet they create right. these schools all the time for other people's children. It's not a surprise, but it's an abomination nonetheless. And one of the reasons that it's not a surprise is because white supremacy, and I think everyone is now becoming aware of it if they hadn't been all along, is not something that was defeated in the 60s, but in some ways the, the white supremacists defeated the, the, the black freedom movement at a certain right. point or defeated it in important ways. And so the ongoing project, which once upon a time took the form of resistance to the Atlantic slave trade, later took the form of abolition, later took the form of civil rights, now is taking the form of anti-mass incarceration, anti-closing of schools in black community, community control in certain areas, and so on. These are the pushbacks that are fighting against a system, not, not the, the, the bigoted ideas of racism per se, but the system that creates this kind of imbalance. So you look at Chicago, where the mayor closed 50 schools two years ago in one fell swoop, all in black communities. What was that about? What was the black youth, the Black Lives Matter kids who've been leading one of the most hopeful and exciting social movements in memory, have fought not just against police, you know, I heard a wonderful thing the other night from one of the BYP kids who said, um, we should stop calling it police excess or police um, abuse. We should just call it policing um, because in some ways it's the same thing for us, you know. So, but she was saying it's not just policing. It's the closing of schools and the lack of jobs and the segregation and the redlining. This is all part of a system and opposing that system is what's required, including fighting for decent schools for all kids in every neighborhood. Well, and in, in fact, I mean, uh, Bill and I were in Chicago a couple of months ago together at a beautiful uh, private school where Forrest Claypool, the um, CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, came, uh. came to speak and, and, and talked about how, you know, um, we can't have schools in Chicago all looking like, like this school, right? Where his kids go. Where his kids go. Yeah. And of course, you know, we, we, you understand the pragmatics about wealth, and I want to say something about economic inequality, but the idea that um, the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools is coming to a school where his kid goes um, to not talk about the dream that he has for all Chicago public schools to look like that school, but instead to talk about the impossibility of that dream um, is significant, right? But do you and, remember what he said about choice? He said, yeah. I'm a big believer in choice, and I chose to send my kids to Francis <laughs> right, Parker. Exactly. And, and you're like, you're, you're, you're just gasping for air. What are yeah. you talking about? Yeah. And I think they should have choice. That's why I'm creating charter schools. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, well, let's get a couple other questions. Michael. Michael, who teaches at Trinity. I teach at you know, an elite school. Um, you know, I'm sorry. Um, teaching at an elite school, private school. The other side is that we seem to be producing, in the words of Bill Derezowitz, excellent sheep. Right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're saying, oh, well, it's great what these other schools offer, but what we're really producing, right, is in fact elite kids, with some exceptions, uh, who are you know, moving on into the corporate world, reproducing these sort of uh, power relations that are creating the divide. And so I'm not as optimistic as, as Bill, I, I would say, mm -hmm. in that I'm not sure that what we're offering, the other side of what's good, is not as good as we uh, actually think. Can I just say two quick things about that? One is I'm not optimistic. I want to I'm sorry. <laughs> hopeful, 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 hopeful. hopeful. So hopeful. Optimists, optimists know what's going to happen. I have no hopeful. idea. Sorry, um, I apologize. But the other thing is that teaching with conscience when you're working, and, and look, Teachers College is an elite institution. Yeah. Harvard's an elite institution. Um, Columbia is a elite institution. You can teach at an elite institution and find ways with conscience to get these kids who have all the advantages to begin to see another window into the world. Great example, when we were at Francis Parker together, there's a young teacher who came from Brooklyn named Kidra, and Kidra was doing a social studies class in which they studied the Chicago public schools. And the guiding question for the semester was what makes a good school? And they discovered that the school they attend, Francis Parker, is a good school, but the one right down the road isn't a good school. 
Mm -hmm. And on April 1st, those students went on strike with the Chicago Public School teachers in an act of solidarity and threw themselves into it. What a terrific thing for a group of elite kids yeah. whose parents include Forrest Claypool and others um, to participate in. You know, I think that's really right. important. Um, and, and of course, I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, and Michael is one of those teachers, as I know some of the, the work that he does, but, but schools aren't obviously going to, those kids, there's so many forces taking those kids into a, a particular direction, right? Not all of them, as you said. Um, but there are also all these teachers in, in all these classrooms, in both public and uh, private or independent schools, that are doing these amazing curriculum with a lot of kids. The problem is that they're doing it despite the current direction of school reform exactly. instead of because of it. And you know, there's that um, saying, uh, we all talk about the ripples that teachers create um, that you don't know about, the ripples you know, ripple out and, and affect change you know, in ways that we don't, we don't hear about. But there's a saying that you can't create ripples if the pond is frozen. And I think what we've seen in the last um, decade of school reform is a freezing of the educational pond, right? And, and not allowing the teachers who are doing that kind of, of good work um, to, to let that happen. It is interesting about citizenship education um, that like one of the things that my book, uh, the, the research from the last 10 years looks at is, is the schools that are doing citizenship education, you know, it asks the question, what kind of citizen are they talking about? And, and uh, uh, it draws on research that Joe Kahn and I did uh, for a long time looking at hundreds of schools across North America. Um, and one of the, the things we found is, is that, loosely speaking, uh, the schools, the programs that taught citizenship um, could fall into these three categories. Is it OK if I just yeah, quickly? Uh, and the first was the personally responsible citizen. And the second we called the participatory citizen, as in participation. And the last was the social justice-oriented citizen. And uh, the thing about you know professors love to make categories. It's not that every program fits neatly into the category, but it gives a, a, a way for us to talk about it with a common language. And by far, the vast majority of programs across uh, um, North America pursue this idea of the personally responsible citizen, which is you know, pick up litter, be a nice person, um, give blood when blood is needed, help an old person across the street, pay your taxes, right? <laughs> um, and and uh, that's the vast majority of citizenship education that goes on. And remember, I talked about democratic, uh, what, what are, what's the role of schooling in a democracy before? We were both talking about that. Well, you might notice that the, those characteristics of the personally responsible citizen, there's not a country on the planet that wouldn't be happy for their citizens to do that, right? North Korea, you know, Iran, China, everyone doesn't want citizens to litter or to, you know, people want to, people to help out when there's a flood. Um, so it's not about democracy, right? The second category uh, was the participatory citizen. These are programs that aim at wanting kids to um, to learn about how government works, to participate, to do collective efforts to, to make change. So like if the, if the participatory citizens are organizing a food drive, then the personally responsible citizens are donating a can of food because they're nice people, right? Um, and, and there are some programs like that, again, in particular teachers in particular places. This third category was what we ended up calling the social justice oriented citizen. And those are the programs that ask kids to ask these, these root causes of problems, right? To look at how social change happens, to identify problems in the society, and to identify structural solutions to those problems. So if the participatory citizens are you know, organizing that food drive, and if the personally responsible citizens are donating a can of food, the social justice-oriented citizens are, are getting their kids to ask, how come in one of the richest countries in the world we have people who are hungry? Right. right? How can that be? And I, I think that it's, it's well, of course, we need elements of all three of those types of citizens. And, um, but we, too, we, we just don't enough systemically and systematically teach kids to ask the kind of questions that look at the root causes of problems. Um, and that's what a large part of, of um, the, the book is aimed for, and it's what I think schools need to do. I mean, I, I think it's both, and it's also um, one of the great issues is, is you can't just look at the absolute money. You, you have to look at the inequality. 
um, because the inequality tells a lot about the values of the society, and, and Bill, in some sense, um, started off there. So of course, there are places where you can do a ton, a fantastic, with very little. Um, but when you have massive inequality, um, there's something e something evil seeps into the system. Jonathan Kozol used to say, I, I don't understand why we throw money at schools, but we appropriate money to the Pentagon. <laughs> and, um, but I, I think that. Uh, there, you know, it's both. I mean, is it is it will? Absolutely. It's the you know, it's the will to create the kind of education that is meaningful, um, and that both Bill and I write about um, in these books. And uh, and uh, is it money? Well, when you're talking about the schools that Bill describes in Chicago or that Jonathan Kozal describes in in Savage Inequalities, um, then it you know it is that too. And it's there's there's no question that um, those the schools in Cuba also, um, which you know have have a fantastic education, um, but it's not like resources don't, don't matter there as well. So, um. You know, I agree it's both. And, and I would emphasize political will because we know what works in education. And I don't want to romanticize the private schools or the suburban schools, but you can take a city like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago and point to schools that work for ordinary kids in ordinary neighborhoods. And we don't have the political will to make that happen, or we don't have the collective will to push the powers that be to make it happen. So broke on purpose is a useful slogan. They're broke on purpose in every sense of the word. And that's a question of politics, not economics, and not psychology, and not sociology. It's a question of politics. So we're going to, I think, end on that I'd note. like, can I just close oh, with yes. one final yes. thing? Because um, both, a, you know, Carol organized a, a, a friend and mentor of both of ours, Maxine Green, died a couple of years ago. 18 months ago now, two years ago. And, uh, and um, she used to say this thing that I thought would be a nice place to end. Uh, she said uh, that the, the purpose of education is to comfort the troubled and trouble the comfortable. And, um, and in a lot of ways, I think both of what um, Bill and I capture in this book is that, of course, in these two books, is that, of course, uh, education and schools and classrooms have to be places where children feel comfortable and welcomed and safe. Uh, but they, but schools also have to be places that um, trouble the comfortable, that make kids and all of us uneasy about the problems that still need to be uh, worked on and improved in this society. So.